Hi everybody, Tony here. Specifically though, Tony on your screen. I get to interact with you from wherever it is I actually am because of the internet. In a more immediate sense though, we're interacting right now because you can see and hear me. But there are plenty of other ways in which we experience our world. I'm talking, of course, about vision, hearing, smell, touch, and taste. You know, the ways in which we perceive the things around us. I'm sure you're all familiar with the concept of the five senses. But did you know that there are actually more than five senses? And that the extra ones are super important and useful too. Heck, you use your sixth sense practically all the time. So what is the sixth sense? The one that seems to have missed the cutoff for being taught to elementary schoolers. It's not some kind of supernatural mental power or a nice Shyamalan thriller. It's something you use every day to do a great number of things. Today on Long Story Short, we're talking about your sixth sense, proprioception. Proprioception really is just as obvious, for lack of a better word, as any of the other senses. Even if you don't know what it is, you're definitely familiar with it. So what actually is proprioception? We can perform a simple experiment to help you feel it. First, extend your arms out to the side as if you're making the shape of an uppercase T. Now close your eyes and slowly move your finger to your nose. Unless you've been drinking alcohol recently, you were probably able to bring your finger to your nose. So how did you do that? How were you able to touch your finger to your nose if you were unable to see them both? With your eyes open, it's obvious to everyone how you can poke your nose. Just use your eyes to gather information about the location of your finger in relation to your nose and close the gap. But with your eyes closed, your sense of vision is no longer receiving information and your other four senses aren't going to cut it either. You don't match your finger to your nose by tasting, smelling, hearing, or feeling your way up to it. Since you can only gain information about your surroundings, including your own body, through your physical senses and your five main senses weren't giving you the information you needed to complete the task, you must have utilized something else. This something else is proprioception. In short, it's your ability to relate the positions of your limbs to each other. It is entirely intuitive and automatic with no conscious thought on your end. Your brain is constantly updating a map of the relative positions of your body parts in 3D space. In this experiment, you used the sense of perceiving where your finger was in relation to your nose to guide it there using precise, auto-corrected muscular contractions. Some people initially react with disbelief when they are told that there are more than five senses. That's totally understandable. After all, most people are so used to experiencing just five senses that trying to squeeze another one in there just doesn't seem possible. But I assure you that proprioception is a bona fide mode of sensing information. For the previous experiment, one might claim that you are just remembering where your finger is from where you saw it last and using that information to touch it to your nose. But here's the thing. If you were strictly using visual memory of your finger and nose to complete this task, things would get really tricky the second you move your finger from its starting position. This is because you've only got that one image stored in your visual memory. Then you close your eyes when the finger changes position, you have no visual information which you can derive spatial estimates from. This is because your memory won't update in real time. That feeling of where your finger is that does update in real time, well, that's not your memory. That's proprioception. Okay, so if it really is its own thing, how exactly does proprioception work? Well, to answer that question, let's think for a moment about how our other senses work. The cause of all sensation is a change in the environment. As living creatures, we can detect various changes in the environment using specialized structures called sense organs. Sense organs are able to detect changes of a specific type. For example, your eyes detect changes in light, which are ultimately interpreted by your brain to form vision. 
proprioception is no different. It has two major sense organs, muscle spindles and tendon organs. Muscle spindles are found in skeletal muscle near the tendons that hold everything together. They're not spread out evenly though. Muscles which have a higher fine motor skill requirement, such as those that drive the fingers, have many muscle spindles, while muscles which require less finesse have fewer. These sense organs are basically seven to eight specialized muscle fibers in a fibrous capsule. Extrafusal fibers are outside of the capsule and can contract like all the other muscle cells. Intrafusal fibers are found inside the capsule and they've got some unique properties. Specifically, they cannot contract. This is practically unheard of in muscle cells. After all, one of the key properties of muscle tissue is that it contracts. That's what muscles do. And yet the middle portions of intrafusal muscle fibers lack the essential proteins for contraction found in all other muscle cells. Even though they cannot contract with their own force, they're still stretched on a regular basis. As all the regular muscle around these capsules contracts and relaxes, they stretch the intrafusal fibers around too. This stretching allows intrafusal muscle fibers to measure the characteristics of a contraction in relation to the muscle itself. They detect information including the length of the muscle and the rate of change of the length. Sensory nerve fiber tracts then transmit this information to the central nervous system where a complete picture of the skeletal muscle system is then formed. Tendon organs, the other sense organs involved in proprioception, are located in tendons near the muscle. Contrast this with the location of muscle spindles, which are in the muscle near the tendon. Also known as Golgi tendon organs, or GTOs, they consist of loose collagen fibers, which form a net which envelopes the ends of a few nerve fibers. When the neighboring muscle is at rest, the collagen fibers are loose, so they do not stimulate the nerve fibers. However, when the muscle contracts, the force of the contraction causes the collagen net to tighten around the terminal end of the nerve fiber. This mechanical interaction stimulates the nerve to send an impulse to your brain. This supplies information about the tension generated by the force of the muscular contractions. Both muscle spindles and tendon organs send information to the brain. And that's where the magic happens, really. The anatomy of the brain is an incredibly dense topic, much like the topic of black holes during my recent video on the organization of the universe. If I really got into the gist, I guess, of how the brain works, I'd run out of room to discuss proprioception. You can expect to get anatomy videos in the future, though. It's cool stuff. At any rate, for the purposes of this video, just know that the brain is made up of many substructures and that these substructures tend to specialize in different things. The cerebellum, one of these substructures, is the eventual end of the line for all of the proprioceptive information sent from every part of the body to the brain. It compiles all that muscle spindle and GTO data from across the body and interprets the signals to determine the specific positions and orientations of the limbs. Then it sends out commands to move them around based on that information. These commands have the combined effect of passively maintaining or changing whatever it is all your movable limbs are doing right now. This isn't just something that affects you when you're trying to move around with your eyes closed either. It manages a ton of your movement, even when you're not thinking about it. For example, somebody who is falling asleep might occasionally bob their head up and down. As their head begins to fall forward due to fatigue, the muscles on the back of their neck begin to stretch due to the applied tension. Muscle spindles detect this change in the muscle length and transmit this to the cerebellum. The cerebellum recognizes that there is an unintended and uncontrolled muscle lengthening occurring and it appropriately stimulates the posterior neck muscles to contract. This stops their head from falling further and instead jerks it up. This automatic reflex happens thanks to proprioception and you don't have to do anything to make it happen. Well, consciously, you don't have to do anything. Of course, this stuff has practical applications too. For example, the experiment we conducted at the beginning of this video is part of the standard field sobriety test. 
Police officers administer that test to drivers suspected of being under the influence of alcohol. Since alcohol inhibits a bunch of the stuff that we discussed that makes proprioception work, people are unable to touch their nose with their fingers if they're drunk. On a somewhat related note, lack of proprioceptive ability is a warning sign in clinical populations, especially the elderly. An inability to properly coordinate automatic muscle reactions can be a symptom of brain damage from a stroke or senescence. Proprioception is also integral to proper performance by athletes. They have to move their bodies with precision in order to perform their best, and proprioception is key to precise movement. Understanding the mechanisms which allow proprioception to give us a sense of where our limbs are is important stuff. The science behind human life has everyday applications to every human on the planet. Unlocking the secrets of human anatomy and physiology allows us to gain new and relevant insights about how our bodies function. This in turn allows us to exert better control over our bodies. As humans, it's important that we are intimately familiar with our senses. The ability to sense change in our bodies and environments is one of the fundamental parts of being alive. So we should make sure that our senses are all working properly. It's easy to determine when vision, hearing, or the other traditional senses fail. It's a bit more complicated to diagnose problems with proprioception, for example. Wrapping our heads around the anatomical basis for proprioception allows clinicians to figure out what's going wrong when people have problems with their coordination. So, as usual, what do you think? Should we be teaching about these six senses in school? What do you think some of your other lesser known senses might be? After all, there's more than just six. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching. Hello everyone, hope you all liked that uh, shorter episode. We're gonna be trying to stick to this sort of um, length. I know that uh, shooting for something more around 10, 15 minutes gave me way more time to uh, pick stock footage and do like little animations and stuff like that. Um, so we're sticking with it. Hopefully the extra couple of days between uh, Thursday and Saturday while we made this transition weren't too grueling to wait through. And double hopefully you found this topic interesting. I know I do, it's, <laughs> we mentioned it a bunch of times, but the human body has way more than five senses. Um, and because we experience them every day, a lot of stuff people just don't even notice, even though, again, this is stuff we rely on. Maybe we'll talk about more in the future. Anywho, thank you as usual for watching. We'll be back next week as usual with another episode of Long Story Short. Have a fantastic Thanksgiving if you're in the United States. Otherwise, have a fantastic week.